today. I have my good friend Dave Grimaldi uh, from the Blockchain Association. He has a very storied and impressive career and background. I could think of very few people who I could have this type of conversation that covers the gamut from elections and regulations to um, what's going on in the blockchain ecosystem. Hey everybody, welcome to Tech Intersect, where we explore the nexus of technology, law, and the people shaping our future in the digital world. I am your fearless host, Professor Tanya M. Evans at Penn State Dickinson Law School. Uh, I work at the intersection of law, technology, and policy, and today we are joined by Dave Grimaldi, a distinguished advocate and strategist whose career spans significant roles in Congress, the FCC, and leading disruptive technology companies through the labyrinth of government regulations, also known as the morass, the alphabet soup, and also policy making and as executive vice president for government relations at the Blockchain Association, Dave is at the forefront of advocating for pro-innovation policy and regulatory framework for the crypto economy. So we will talk about the future of blockchain and digital assets, uh, trying to read the regulatory tea leaves in this time of an election cycle. Uh, that might be a very short conversation, but we'll just say in a moment. Um, but we will talk about all of that and more in a moment. But Dave, welcome. Thank you, Professor. Very honored to be here. Very excited. It's good to see you. Excellent. Well, first, share what initially drew you to the intersection of technology, policy, and advocacy, especially within the context of disruptive technologies. Absolutely. I began um, my foray into this with my first job out of law school on Capitol Hill, working for an African-American congressman from New York City named Ed Towns. And Towns mm. was a senior member on the House Commerce Committee, which oversaw technology and the internet and media and telecom policy. Mm. And it was again happenstance uh, that I that I met him and that I became one of his um, chief advisors. And from there, I went to another uh, just pioneer, legendary congressman named Jim Clyburn, mm. uh, who was the House Majority Whip here in Congress. He's a Democrat in charge of counting the votes for the Speaker and the leadership of uh, the House of Representatives. Continued to do tech and telecom policy for him, but also was on the floor for every vote, learned how Congress works, how the lines intersect, how really and truly how legislation routes itself through committees and through Congress and through the Senate. Uh, and from there, I left to go to a regulatory agency, as you pointed out, the Federal Communications Commission, mm -hmm. not unlike the Securities and Exchange Commission or the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. These are all independent regulatory agencies. And I got to see in a, in a chief of staff role how a notice of proposed rulemaking turns into an actual rule followed by a law given to the agency by Congress. Mm -hmm. And then the expert agency turns the rule into, or turns the law into actual pra practice. How does that law intersect with American industry and American companies and, and global companies actually? And that is the final step before a law is put, you know, into practice under administrative procedure. And and that was um, a tremendous experience for me. But but to the to the core of your question, how did I get involved in this space, particularly in digital assets? Again, just the path <laughs> that life takes. Mm. I, uh, after I left those roles uh, here in D.C. on the government side, I opened and I also ran D.C. offices for a publicly traded company for Pandora, which was then the streaming oh. music leader. Mm -hmm. And then for a very large 700 member association filled with digital advertising companies. So Google, Facebook, CBS, ESPN, all of them, companies that use your personal data online to target ads to you, privacy, uh, it, all, all manner of, of commerce and judicial issues. And at that time, uh, I was not looking to leave and my very, very close and dear friend, from years ago on the Hill, Kristen Smith, who is the CEO of mm -hmm. the Blockchain Foundation, reached out to me and said that she is building this incredible consortium 
of crypto and blockchain companies. And at the time, Professor, I want to say we were fewer than 30 companies. We're now 115 or 114 wow. member companies. And it all just kind of blew up into what it what it is following the President Biden's infrastructure bill that purported to tax digital assets in a new way. Mm -hmm. And the industry woke up and took notice that it had to pay attention to Washington, D.C. and to the federal government because this flourishing ownership economy ecosystem was all of a sudden being looked at by right. the agency. By Congress, and that that is that was a landmark moment in the history of of the digital asset uh, ecosystem in this country, and I think globally as well. It's so important, and you've t touched on a number of really, really important things that I want to drill down on. You know that I teach uh, blockchain, crypto, and law at. at Dickinson Law, but I also teach administrative law and information privacy law. And everything that you just mentioned falls squarely within kind of that trifecta of my, my teaching package. Um, mm -hmm. And what I think that people don't fully understand and embrace so often when we talk about um, the advancement of crypto policy and law, at the heart of it is understanding how administrative agencies work. You mentioned specifically independent agencies that are at the core of the focus, although certainly there are numerous others, probably every other agency has some, you know, pathway to at least look at and to, um, uh, to align strategies in some sense with the overall advancement of policy for any given administration, not just this, but that that's just how, how it works. Um, I'm, talk a bit about the challenges of not only um, navigating the, the regulatory space. You mentioned, obviously we have rules and regulations. We have um, agencies that have rulemaking authority, but also enforcement authority. We've seen in particular the SEC use quite a bit on the enforcement side, not as much on the rulemaking side, which has caused um, a number of problems in the industry. It's the difference between trying to figure out if your project fits into a specific regulated party and, and try and read the, the tea leaves about what your business should do, as opposed to having greater um, certainty and clarity from a rulemaking point of view. Talk about the balance of and the interactions between trying to advance policy considerations while navigating the different agencies. Um, and a second part of that is, I imagine you do the same thing on the legislative side, as there mm -hmm. is wrangling with oversight committees, right? So it's not just with the administrative agencies, but obviously, their framework is impacted by Congress, because Congress is the one that sets up the enabling legislation to begin with. I know that's a lot, but it fits so nicely with your entry. I'm, I'm hoping to get uh, your, your thoughts on that. Absolutely. It, um, it, and and you you covered you covered the landscape. I mean, you really did it. It 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 is a it is the intersection of of a of a Congress saying this lovingly as a former senior staffer and it and mm -hmm. you know I'm romantic about the institution, but a dysfunctional Congress Understood. that increasingly is more partisan and rancorous and divisive. Mm -hmm. And there are strong opinions on everything, be it pro life, pro choice, the border, what have you. But one thing right. is where we were hoping uh, Congress could coalesce was around the ownership economy and more democratization via the use of crypto and blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. And we have we have noticed, uh, like with anything, it is a very intimidating subject matter. Members of Congress, especially the older ones, when you go in to do initial education or discuss with them uh, how crypto, blockchain, digital asset technology works, they are grasping. Is this technology, right. is it finance? It's, wait, hold on, it's something in the middle. But if I have a Wells Fargo account, how do I use crypto? Okay, you know what, I don't understand and I've got to get to the floor to vote. And this mm. is that my constituents are talking to me about and it's not in front of me right now. So this is just too much, I gotta go. And so navigating that has become you know, a, a wonderful challenge. That, that we are doing through education, one-on-ones, et cetera. Um, 
But to your question about the regulations mixing with the legislation and mixing with congressional intent, we unfortunately here in D.C., this industry, has not been defined by amazing use cases and the great things that we are doing. And we are at pains to to really highlight those, and we can go through 100 of them. Mm-hmm. We have been defined, as some industries are, by newsworthy uh, bad moments, FTX being one of them. The new one is the specter of money laundering and illicit finance making its way along the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And what that has done is for a brand new nascent industry that has not been around as long as the pharmaceutical industry or really the technology industry or the manufacturing industry, it has made regulators and Congress skeptical, wary, and distrustful out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Down the road after we're established and we're part of the firmament of the American economy, but right out of the gate, you know, with this industry being so new, it is, well, you had a crypto founder who lost $8 billion in consumer assets, or you're enabling uh, terrorist financing like Hamas and North Korea, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, And that's a real shame. And that's hugely unfortunate. And we exist to change those opinions. And luckily, time does that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. The founder of FTX has been seen to be a, 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 a sole criminal actor, and the justice system worked. And we are myth busting. And worked quickly. And worked far, quickly. Far I more quickly, that. far quicker, I should say, than when you compare uh, Bernie Madoff, Lehman Brothers. When you know you start to check off the list of other times that took far longer. That from the moment that he was picked up in the Bahamas to the time that he was found guilty, and I think we're now waiting sentencing, was just a little over a year. That's right. And and it 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 really, really set us back in trustworthiness, credibility, and accountability. Luckily, mm-hmm. the 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 clarity that this was a single bad actor has been um has been made known. And but it, it it is it is forcing us to rehab our re- rehabilitation at the same time when we're doing introductions to this industry. Right. I, saying this as a former Democratic staffer, Democrats are are very um, fearful of decentralization, and they're also a little fearful of the ownership economy and the risk that comes with consumers controlling their own assets, which is largely mm-hmm. the beauty of of crypto. But it also is a risk if you. If you don't understand the responsibility you have on yourself via your private keys and and um, and storing your money in a safe place, et cetera, we're doing all of that education. Mm-hmm. It is, um, and and so this is a, a a large hill to climb with legislators and regulators, and we are doing it in the face of a Biden administration that has a consumer protection mandate way out in front, and mm-hmm. the Securities and Exchange Commission independent agency, but the chairman, Gary Gensler, was appointed by President Obama. Mm -hmm. Um, And other regulatory agencies are eyeing our industry with with a volatility lens. This is a volatile industry. Consumers do not know what they're getting into. They need to be educated. We need to keep a very tight grip on crypto companies and founders and, and, and blockchain companies to make sure that they are collateralized, that they are operating properly, and that they're making the proper disclosures. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. Professor, they're going about this in a way that gives absolutely minimal certainty to the developers in our space. And mm-hmm. it has led to enforcement actions and fines and other heavy-handed overtures um, and declarations from the SEC that has prompted crypto founders and venture capital funds, et cetera, to possibly invest that money in new entities and developers in other countries. And that is for American innovation across the board. We are a country that gave the world Apple and it gave the world Google and that opened these big doors and broke down barriers for dot-coms to flourish and Mm. to be global leaders. Well, we're doing the opposite right now for crypto and blockchain technology but we persevere nonetheless. And, mm-hmm. the, and the, the cooler heads are, 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 are prevailing a little bit in Congress with members understanding that we need a central regulator. Or is, is a crypto token a security or is it a commodity? And we can get into that. Right. And that has not been 
put into statutory language and passed through Congress and signed by the president. So that's still hanging out there. Um, and without that, again, it gives especially a Democratic uh, White House a little bit of hesitation and anxiety that these are actual consumer assets being released mm -hmm. by American companies that are undefined under the Howard right. test, which we can get into, which determines a commodity and other, other factors. But right now, the Securities and Exchange Commission is operating under decades and decades old securities laws. And there is, there is a reason in, in telecommunications that the 1996 Telecom Act that governs all of telecommunications has not been updated because the right. technology moves too fast. It's hard to get consensus in Congress to put a new law in the books. And I think the word internet was mentioned in the 96 Telecom Act you know, fewer than 30 times. Right. And it doesn't want to update it because it could get in the way of innovation. Well, we're the opposite. We need that certainty so our companies know that what they're creating isn't going to be struck down or that there's not going to be a notice from the SEC or cease and desist mm -hmm. along those lines. And I was at a dinner the other night with a number of Democratic congressmen, and and they said very innocently, you all don't want rules and regulations so that you can do whatever you want, and that's reckless, and that's irresponsible. And I interrupted her, wonderful right. uh, senior congresswoman, and I said, no, that is precisely the opposite of, of why we want rules and regulations. We need them so that we know that what we're producing and providing is lawful and not right. – it's for all the right reasons. Um and and so it's it's it is an uphill battle right now, but it is it is really the mother of all education, advocacy, and lobbying, because mm -hmm. in complex subject matter, this isn't ta like talking about uh, you know environmental issues that that members of Congress can relate to and understand, right. right? Or things in in the social sphere that they see every day and they understand, or traditional mm -hmm. financial things. This is new. It moves fast. It's disruptive. And it's decentralized. And that right. word and decentralized, it, boy, does that yeah. give Congress, uh, Democratic members of Congress, a little bit of fear because <laughs> centralized institution has board of directors and a board of trustees, et cetera. And decentralized finance is it's peer to peer mm -hmm. and it's governed by the commons. And again, there is a liberating beauty in that. And it is not a founder who can switch a user interface to something you're used to every day. And all of a sudden it's, whoa, well, I didn't know that was coming. This right. is this is by the commons. So very, very long way to get back to hopefully where you're going with that, Professor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It leads me to um, a next point that I wanted you to weigh in on, given what you just articulated and laid out, the impact of exchange traded funds, uh, 11 spot uh, Bitcoin ETFs were... Um, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. reluctantly, my words, not yours, you can use your own words, approved by the SEC. Um, and we haven't seen the skyfall. We've seen inflows and outflows kind of balance out. But mm -hmm. I'm concerned and I'm excited about that for the folks who like this is not Satoshi's dream. OK, mm -hmm. we get that. But many people will not be able to get from where they are today to what the white paper expressed in 2008. And, and if you're, you know, um, a crypto OG, what you would understand about autonomy, uh, self-sovereignty, when you talk about self-custody, it's not a natural extension for all the reasons that you mentioned, but there is still an opportunity for folks who may, even if they do understand, want to have exposure to the benefits of the asset, but in a regulated environment that they do understand. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of exchange traded funds that are now available. Do you think that's helpful? Talking about it on the podcast, in some of my articles, so many folks, not even sy just systemically marginalized folks from the existing system, but even just folks who you would think would know what an ETF is, have no idea. So it is kind of like we built it, but will folks come if they don't even understand how to set up a brokerage account, what an exchange traded fund is, what the various sectors are for ETFs and why this is so relevant to give exposure to an asset without actually holding it. Um, have we advanced forward? Is it two steps forward, one step back? Or are we back in the educational realm that you were mentioning as well? I, I oh no, I, I think it's I think it's positive across the board. I mean, exchange traded options 
are standardized contracts allowing you know buying and selling an asset at a at a at a at a predetermined price which was the whole point in the exposure that i think offerings wanted to give consumers so that they could they could mm-hmm. have a a piece of the action and not actually have to go out and pursue ownership by themselves they could do it through a fund or they could do something else and they could do it within a within a specified time frame and that gives them mm. flexibility it lets traders speculate um on or hedge against future price movements etc and i think that that is i think that's a, a a liberating and kind of on ramp to crypto assets and investing that mm. only increases the pie and the awareness around enriching your wealth and owning a piece of the digital asset ownership economy um, that you couldn't before. And, you know, there's, there is a, it's people who are averse to risk and future price movements that come with stocks or bonds, et cetera, you don't have the obligation to buy or sell that underlying asset. And I think right. that's exposure that kind of brings consumers along a little bit slowly and it lets them talk to a broker or financial advisor to assess this. Is this something where they want to put their money? Um, they've heard about it. They don't understand it. But all of a sudden, you know, this mm. market regulated and traded fund and Congress applauded it. I mean, especially Democrats. They, there were a lot of congratulatory um, phone calls and tweets saying, you know, this is um, this is a step in the right direction. This is something that gives investor protection and safety and soundness. So, I, I think it's I think it's positive across the board. I um mm-hmm. hopefully that I mean that that is and that's exactly how I think the message was received here in D.C. You know, Grayscale uh, under the Digital Currency Group, one of one of Blockchain Association's member companies, was one of the leading mm-hmm. drivers um, in the courts and at the SEC around this and. Uh, and it was it was a it was a full blown education campaign here in D.C. to talk about you know what an ETF would do, how it works, what investor protections there are, um, and how this again just makes that exposure to this industry bigger and safer. Um, and so that if you're not willing to dip your toe in and buy something on your own, you can now go through a brokerage or someone you trust. So yes, I think it's it thumbs up. Yeah. And um, it gets back to the idea of education, not just on the Hill, but of consumers and investors to see the wealth of opportunities and and focus on, you know, my, a lot of my work focuses on getting people to understand and appreciate that the true wealth building occurs with assets. You know, the fact that uh, crypto assets are in general text um, as a capital asset and the differences between being a high income earner tax at a higher rate mm-hmm. versus uh, really channeling any um, additional money to assets that actually go out into the world working harder than you. Um, so that there's some semblance of a future where you enjoy the things that you're doing with the people that you love, not working until you're 101, right. um, a story for another day. Um, it, uh, lightning round to uh, get you back to the, the good work that you do. We've talked a lot about education, public awareness, et cetera. Um, and so uh, I want to end on what the outlook is for Uh, regulation in the space. You talked about why, excuse me, why it's critically important to have a clearer vision of what the rules are, even if the industry doesn't like them, I suppose. It's the difference when I think from a a legal perspective, at least having a bright line rule (laughs) or anything that people can have greater assurance that when they're building businesses in the United States, that they are not looking offshore somewhere else to, um, you know, to avoid the risk of being wrong after the fact. Um, and so what 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 are we looking at here in 2024, an election cycle, and in the next couple of years, what's the work that needs to be done to advance to a more mature um, ecosystem and industry? It's multi-part. It's a great question. Uh, there is a lot swirling around in the courts uh, that will determine, again, the standing of tokens in the eyes of the federal government, especially in the eyes of the Securities and Exchange Commission. 
SEC mm-hmm. versus Ripple is one of the more noteworthy ones. SEC versus Coinbase, SEC versus Binance, SEC versus Kraken, Coin Center versus the IRS, the Tornado Cash cases. There's all kinds of litigation ongoing. Blockchain Association can walk anyone through that. We're we're on top mm-hmm. of all of it with our with our legal department. The courts will will it will will win their way, and judicial opinions in with with the lack of congressional action and with a hostile SEC uh, without a statute on the books to follow, a lot mm-hmm. of the action is going to be in the courts and setting precedent and having that ammunition to take to the CFTC and the SEC and to show them that federal judges are agreeing with us and our industry perspective that we need clarity um, and to and to really set about moving those wheels in Congress. So it's that that triangle I mentioned. It's 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 Congress is up here. Mm-hmm. A a statute that gives that clarity on the definition of a token, a primary regulator, and that market structure piece, uh, that would across the board give definitions wherever they're wherever they're needed. Congress, though, as I mentioned, is dysfunctional right now. There are bills moving through the House of Representatives. One uh, seeking to clarify and put structure around stable coins here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And the second one that deals with market structure and financial technology um, along the lines of crypto uh, uh, and blockchain technology. Those two bills passed a House committee, first ever crypto related bills to pass a House committee, pulling down to a footnote, Professor, uh, starting in January of last year, there were two committee, two subcommittees in Congress with the words digital assets in their, in their team. Mm. So that is a stamp of legitimacy in this city is that you now have two subcommittees in the House of Representatives dedicated to digital assets. Pulling back up from the from the footnote, those bills will make it to the House floor if they pass the House. Unclear, they're Republican drafted bills, unclear what happens in a Democratic-led Senate, where the chairman mm-hmm. of the banking committee is definitely a consumer advocate who is uh, keeping a very watchful eye and a discriminating eye on on digital assets and, and um and is running his committee wanting to get to the to the bottom of of uh, deep questions and answers about consumer protection. So what happens to those bills when they get to the Senate? Mm-hmm. So that brings to mind what happens again, it all goes back to the election. Elections have consequences. If Democrats lose the Senate, then you have a chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, a Republican who will likely be more friendly to open markets, capitalism, crypto technology. But at the same time, the House, which is currently led by Republicans, could switch to Democratic rule. That's what the polls are kind of mm-hmm. alluding to right now. If that's the case, Congress remains divided. It flips on both sides, the House and the Senate, and it remains divided. What mm-hmm. does Donald Trump being the nominee do for turnout? What is an incumbent president in Joe Biden do for turnout, especially among young people who are more mm-hmm. crypto- being more crypto centric? And a lot of them uh, in our in our community in the, in the blockchain and crypto space, a lot of, of voters who are uh, token holders and blockchain developers, they are looking for crypto friendly candidates. And there are some right. who are single issue voters along those lines. They will be seeking those candidates out there. There, there is fundraising that is pouring in right now to crypto friendly candidates. So what does that mean again for the election? What does that mean for control of Congress? And what does that mean for the White House? Mm. But in the, it, while all of that is in an uncertain swirl, the courts are still humming along. Our cases are progressing. Our member company uh, litigation keeps moving. Some of the best lawyers in the business are looking at this. Um, and we will we will need to wait and see. And Congress will endure a couple more recesses. There will be an Easter recess, a Fourth of July recess. All of a sudden, we're going to be at the end of July. Congress will right. be for the entirety of August. It'll, they'll only come back very, very sparingly in September and October as they lead up to the November election, which means, right. to be translated, there are very few legislative days left to pass a bill and do and do push forward definitions that our industry desperately wants. So it, it is uh, it is going to be a heck of a 2024. And it's a very fun time mm-hmm. to be in this industry, especially here in Washington, D.C., trying to help guide it along. Um and it's exciting. It's it's uncertain and it's exciting, which translates into adrenaline, which <laughs> makes it nice. adrenaline and coffee, 100%. as we as we spoke about earlier. That's right. 
Yes. Well, that leads us. Thank you for that. I think that is a perfect place to um, to tie this up in a, in a not so neat, but very nice bow as we focus on building consensus, as we focus on education, as we focus on fostering dialogue between the crypto industry, federal policymakers, especially in an area as rapidly evolving as uh, decentralized technologies with all of the other Web3 technologies having an impact simultaneously. We're talking artificial intelligence and machine learning and the Internet of Things, all of that. Intimidating. All of it. Yeah. And absolutely. And the one thing, and you and I were at, a, at an event with Congressman Jim, Kime, uh, Jim Himes, Democrat from Connecticut. The one thing that we need for all of your listeners to hear is we need use cases to offset mm. uh, is decentralization scary and anxiety producing for Democrats. They don't know exactly how all this works. The one thing that offsets that is use cases. What is this doing for the constituents in congressional districts? How are they using it in urban and minority communities? How are they using blockchain technology in, in rural communities? What is the uptick? How is uh, crypto and blockchain enabling Ukrainians, or I'm sorry, Russians to give to Ukrainian freedom fighters without uh, mm -hmm. being detected? How is it do? How is it uh, allowing people to do remittances and cross border payments with without hefty uh, uh, fees to send money to loved ones across borders? It's instantaneous. NFTs and the creator economy are there creators in congressional districts that elected officials should know about use mm -hmm. cases, use cases, use cases. That is where that's mm -hmm. where we're in the most need. Outstanding. Well, anything that I can do to further the cause, um, you have my bat line. Um, I'm intimately interested and focused on this work. I think it's important work, critical work that you all are doing at Blockchain Association. Please let folks know in learning more uh, about what the association does, what you are doing uh, to advance the cause. How can people reach out and learn more? Absolutely. We can use all the help we can get. We're growing fast and uh, and we're loving every minute of it. And I am at Dave at the blockchain association org. Again, we are policy legal lobbying here in D.C. And um, please be in touch anyone at all. And uh, and we'll keep fighting the fight. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'll include the link in the show notes. Dave Grimaldi, thank you so much. You are now a friend of the show, much like Kristen Smith, shout out, as well. And this is the first time, sir, but definitely not the last. I look forward to our next conversation. It's It's been an honor. Thank you, Professor. Thanks for having me. Excellent.